Hello and welcome to the 27th episode of Tailoring in Conversation. In this series, I'll be talking to tailors, business owners, cloth merchants, and other industry participants from all around the globe to gain a better insight into their worlds. My guest for today is Marlouz Dotswell. Marlouz is a professional corsetier and embroiderer based in Delft, a small and yet international town in the Netherlands. In her work, she brings natural history and art together with an exceptional amount of craftsmanship and detail. In our conversation for today, we're going to be talking about corsets, embroidery, her background, and more. So let's get started. Marluz, thank you very much for, for making the time. I've been really looking forward to talk to you as you uh, have a set of skills that I uh, haven't seen in anyone in my surroundings. So uh, I think people are going to enjoy this conversation. I'll do my best to ask the right questions. But first of all, hello and how are you? Well, thank you for having me, first of all, and uh, I'm very excited and also a little bit nervous, but uh, hopefully I'll get through that <laughs> part. I'm sure we'll um, get through that. I'm really well, and <laughs> I'm really well, and I hope you are as well. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually enjoying the conversation we are going to have. So, um, the, the first question I'd like to ask you, uh, especially you, because you seem to be making very unique things that fall outside of the practical domain for the everyday person. What I would like mm -hmm. to ask you is when you were a kid growing up like around 10, 11, 12, what type of a kid were you? I mean, in what sort of a world was your fantasy and, and how did you see the world and explore the world around you? Ooh. Interesting question. Um, I was definitely uh, a dreamer. I think on every school report, it would have been said or mentioned somewhere, don't mm -hmm. stare out the window so much and uh, get back on earth, you know. <laughs> I was always <laughs> off in my own little world and mm. uh, always making things, making things out of uh, scraps of fabric, materials, unusual things, and also... Uh, a lot of, um, oh, my, my mom always um, hated that I was cutting up all her magazines before she could read them. So I would mm -hmm. uh, flick through it and then just cut out everything I liked and put it in a big scrapbook. And then she mm -hmm. would be like, what happened to this page? <laughs> There's something missing. But yeah, just off with the pixies for sure. Uh, mm -hmm. I would read a lot as well. Uh, a lot of uh, books that I wasn't even allowed to take outside of the library because uh, the age on my pass would not let me. <laughs> so I, yeah. when I was 10, I would be reading uh, lots of uh, novels uh, from the adult section and mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't let me take them home. So I would just sit there all day and like read them there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. What sort of novels were you reading, if, if I may ask? Uh, a lot of historical uh, novels. So uh, partly based on actual uh, historical events, but also... Mm -hmm from a slightly different perspective sometimes. So I would love to read um, books about uh, Arthurian legends, but then uh, mm. I would really like it if it was written by a female. Uh, so it would be completely a different story than just about mm. heroes and knights and evil women that are that are witches, you know? Yeah. Uh, but like, what? Tell, tell me the other side of the story. I was very curious to know um, different perspectives on historical mm -hmm. happenings and situations. Yeah, yeah. And and so when, what was the earliest, me what is the mer earliest memory you have from something you made or the first time you remember that you thought, I have to put a few things together and make something out of it? Okay. Uh, well, uh, I come from quite a creative family anyway, so my mm -hmm. grandmother and my mother both sew a lot. And nice. uh, I would then uh, get some of the scraps of fabric that they would have left um, or have left over. And then I would then um, see something uh, in a museum or I would uh, fantasize about what would this person be wearing that I'm reading about, mm -hmm. you know, like what would they be wearing? And... Uh, just trying out things and of course stitches you know this big and 
uh, things that I would have to sew myself into because I wouldn't have a zipper or, mm. or buttons or anything, or I would use buttons that were so obnoxiously big, but made out of a uh, mother of pearl. And mm. I would just think, oh, like all the colors come together in this. So I just want mm. to wear it. And it doesn't matter if it, it looks ridiculous <laughs> to other people. I'm just going to yeah. wear it. And my mm. mom would say to me, you can't wear it at the school, you know, don't do it. <laughs> because people will talk, you know, I mean, growing up in the Netherlands, you know, I mean, you can't wear anything that is outrageous because people will point and laugh in your face. So mm. uh, she would say, don't wear it to school. And of course, I would then just stuff it in my backpack mm. and wait till I was at school and then quickly get changed until one of my teachers phoned my mom and asked her, like, don't you guys have money at home? Because <laughs> she wears these rags i mean you know what's yeah. going, what's happening in your in your family yeah <laughs> so yeah so, but i think i was about seven or eight years old when i started doing that and mm -hmm. then it just kind of exploded when i went to high school and everyone was wearing like expensive sneakers and expensive like track suits that i just mm. couldn't figure out i just didn't know why people would want to wear that at all because mm -hmm. I didn't think it was it didn't look expensive to me like when I think of expensive clothes I think of uh, beautiful silks and um, cashmere and you know handmade uh, mm -hmm. with like proper proper materials and not something mm -hmm. with just a brand stamped on top of it you know yeah yeah so I just uh, I just started the yeah um, exploring uh, mm -hmm making my own things and just wearing whatever the hell I wanted. <laughs> was it yeah. was it mainly clothes that you were making or were you also making cuz looking at at the work you create you also make you know small object like things. Uh and of yeah. course the materials that you use are still the the threads and the fabrics and 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 the other yeah. things that that make up the beautiful work that you make but were you also interested in in making like other objects out of I don't know wood or metal or glass or whatever well um, uh, not so much out of uh, wood and metal but uh, I definitely worked with a lot of beads but I used to really love uh, sculpting with clay as well mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I love painting as well drawing I was always drawing sketching um, mm -hmm. trying to like mimic an oil painting but then with like cheap watercolors you know mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> like yeah. just trying to make the most of little material that we had at home uh but yeah just being innovative with whatever was laying at hand yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so what did you do at school when you grew up later on like when you were 16 17 18 how did you choose your direction and how did you decide you know because i I've, I've lived in the Netherlands as well, and, and I kind of like have an idea of how the yeah. the the, clo the handmade bespoke clothing sector is there. It's it's pretty small, although it's growing now. But yeah. how did you really decide this is what I want to do and I want to do it in this country? Oh, I think I think none of those things is what, what really drew me into what I do now. I think mm. I always was making things. I was always creating things. I was always thinking of um, uh, ways to make that what I was dreaming of a reality. And mm. people would always say to me, you know what you should do, you should go to art school. So I thought, okay, that is it. I'm going to art school. Um, I didn't know which one, I didn't know, uh, what that actually meant it just it was just something that resonated with me and it was also seen as to me the only option out there that would make sense for me mm -hmm. to go and pursue but then because I was such a dreamer and such a um, I had very um, particular interests so uh, I was terrible at uh, mathematics for instance science mm. also just it didn't really grab me the way that history and biology uh, would mm -hmm. and also languages I, really, I do like languages as well um, mm -hmm. and uh, so 
my markings on that on those subjects that I wasn't so good at were so terrible that that kind of uh, drew my whole uh, yeah educational uh, mm. level down. And mm. uh, over here in the 90s, especially, um, they decided that it doesn't matter if you're really good at one thing or like a little section of things. If you can't perform well on the other stuff, then your whole um, level of education has to be lower. So mm -hmm. uh, I, yeah, we have a, a strange kind of uh, a high school system where you have different levels uh, mm -hmm. of education. So you've got a more academic uh, level where you can go straight to university afterwards. And the one underneath that is you go straight to college afterwards. And then the mm -hmm. other one is the MAFO is when you finish at 16 and you go and do something practical with your life. So you mm -hmm. go into mechanic or um, uh, beautician uh, education or uh, yeah, just things that are very practical. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, I went from being at the highest level entry point <laughs> high school. I did two years of that and then I was dropped two levels with no prospect of going to art school because you, that's the university level over here. Yes. So, uh, I just, I didn't know what to do with myself. I just thought, that's it. I have mm. failed at life and yeah. I just really wanted to start over and just, uh, I didn't know what to do with myself. I went mm. and um, made a portfolio for a, a graphic design school and mm. uh, they said, okay, well, interesting things you brought to us they are too artistic They're where was this graphics in, design school oh, it was in, in utrecht uh okay. yeah it was in utrecht yeah. and i thought okay well this may be my little step up to go to mm. art school so i'll do this mm. first and mm. then when i finish that i will i will continue growing and it, go to, it is funny to when you say it is funny when you say you went to an art school and they told you you're too creative it was too creative. They said, we, we really want to see instantly when we open your, your, your portfolio, we want to see what it's about. And oh, yeah. you have so many stories. There are too many stories around it. It's not mm -hmm. instantly clear what, what it is that you want to mm -hmm. um, uh, vocalize through your art. It's too mm -hmm. artistic. Uh, uh, and what, what we do as a school is... Um, uh, we uh, help people to become uh, graphic designers and that mm -hmm. means that uh, for they make a billboard for in mm -hmm. the middle of a, uh, a park and everyone mm -hmm. looks at this billboard and they need to know what it's about. They mm -hmm. need to be grabbed and what you do, it's too arty. You should yeah. go to art school. Uh -huh. <laughs> I see, I see, I see. Okay. So when I'm, I'm 16, and I can't go to art school because I need something for, to do first. Um, mm -hmm. And then I can uh, move upwards. And they said, we don't want to be seen as a stepping stone for you. So mm -hmm. off you go. Uh, we, we don't want that. So I had like two weeks um, to decide on what else I wanted to do with my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, being 16, you have to go to school. So there's no two ways about it. Um, and a few years before that, I got some study books from my grandmother. I think she got it off a friend who somewhere in the 70s uh, did um, uh, a fashion uh, uh, degree uh, in Leiden. And all mm -hmm. the study books that she had, uh, she gave to me. And mm -hmm. I taught myself how to pattern draft. Like I could pattern draft by the time I was 13, 14. Uh, mm -hmm. And they were all based in the um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, method uh, of mm -hmm. drafting pattern. So I taught myself how to do formulas. So for someone who's not very good at mathematics, I can <laughs> draft patterns mm -hmm. <laughs> and manage to teach myself how to do that to make mm -hmm. things actually fit my body. Um, mm -hmm. And so I went for an interview at the fashion school here in The Hague. And uh, they said, uh, so what draws you in? I'm like, well, I'm really into 
drawing, creating and everything. And I make my own clothes, but I want to know how to do it properly, like mm. for real. And um, uh, they said, oh, we can see on your uh, form that you can also draft patterns. And uh, they said, you probably mean you trace them out of a magazine. And I'm like, no, uh, <laughs> I taught myself how to do a wood up. They're like, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, basically the person that interviewed me said, don't get your hopes up. Like you don't uh, design here. You don't learn how to run a company. What you learn here is to work in an atelier um, and you do just do production. It, mm -hmm. That means you need to work fast, neat, and don't ask any questions. Uh, mm -hmm. All you have to do to apply to this school is proof that you are a person. So you need a passport and you need to prove that you're breathing. That's it. So <laughs> that's how I ended up at fashion school <laughs> here mm -hmm. in the Netherlands. And uh, yeah. Was, right, right. Uh, yeah. And, and so did you, because you're specialized in making corsets. And yeah. Um, corsets are something very specialized not only because well not everyone wears corsets nowadays and learning how to make corsets is also something that is like it, it's it's pretty intense so did you know that you wanted to specialize in corsets or was that something that just naturally developed to, as you kind of like went through your career uh, it kind of naturally de de developed where I, mm -hmm. I'd like to do a lot of dressing up as well mm -hmm. as a teenager. And uh, I always had a fascination for corsets and mm -hmm. watching um, like costume dramas with my mother uh, and with my grandmother as well. Mm -hmm. um, I was just always enthralled by uh, mm -hmm. these, these corsets that everyone was uh, mentioning to be torturous and horrible to wear and painful and um uh i was just intrigued by it i don't know uh, mm -hmm. exactly how to explain it uh, but just something that uh forms a foundation of your garment i mean it, it completely um uh, it, it it defines the way the rest of the clothes fit, uh, fit your body and mm -hmm. uh, it's such a foundation garment as well that um, I was just very interested in how to make it uh, so mm -hmm. it would fit well. And mm -hmm. uh, after buying one, I mean, I, I saved money for ages to buy one mm -hmm. off the rail, <laughs> put it on. And I thought, yeah, they're not lying. It it hurts. It's mm -hmm. horrible to wear. It's uh, it's not comfortable at all. Like, um, and uh, But I decided that that is because it is not made for me. It is such mm -hmm. a close fitting garment. You have so little room for error that if a seam lies over a point where uh, it can hit your rib or uh, mm -hmm. the point of the hip bone, then that can be so uncomfortable. And if just by shifting it a little bit, um, mm -hmm. uh, it can be a different experience. And also the mm -hmm. shape of the course is so important important to get right as well so um, the ones that you buy in a shop most of the time uh, and the ones that you order online from like mass produced uh, uh, that are mass produced in uh, mm. other countries uh, they're usually just tubes like a cylinder there's no shape to them they have right. like metal beading in them but they mm. have no real shape so they compress your whole body so everything is just kind of squished together and it doesn't mm. really give you a nice shape. And mm. uh, uh, by studying uh, corsets in uh, museums and mm -hmm. uh, uh, books, I kind of discovered that the shape of, uh, of the corset really defines how it fits as well. So mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of optical illusion going on with corsets as well where mm -hmm. you kind of alter the proportions of a person. So you make them a little bit unnatural. And just mm -hmm. by changing small things and small sections of the body, uh, mm -hmm. it does something to your eyes. You know, it just, it makes you think, of, oh my God, that person has got an hourglass figure when they're mm -hmm. usually more a potato, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and uh, that doesn't mean that they're being... Um, 
like squished and in a in a horrible way. It's just that mm-hmm. you kind of sculpt the body and you also build out certain other areas. So you mm-hmm. can use a bit of padding for the hip area or mm-hmm. for the bust or and just by doing those kind of little things you can change the way someone looks at the mm-hmm. yeah. What I find very interesting from what you said um, I find everything interesting so far, but one thing very particular was that you you emphasize how important seam placement is on, for corsets and that it massively affects the comfort of the corset. And so how would you say, I mean, this is a very, uh, this is actually a side question, but I'm just curious to know, what are your margins for seam placements or displacements within corset making i mean how 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 much can you offset a seam until it starts to become really uncomfortable uh there are no limits really in mm. in what you, i mean you can make a corset with very minimal boning i mean the mm. only reason that the boning really is in there is to keep the the tension of the fabric uh mm. vertical uh, so you 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 like uh-huh. if you make a seam there Mm-hmm. And you start to tighten it, it starts to compress and it mm-hmm. makes wrinkles in the waist area. Yeah. And uh, it's just tension marks. And you're trying to kind of eradicate that by uh, putting in the boning. It just and it needs to be in there quite securely, quite sturdily and like really sewn in. Uh, mm-hmm. So it has no uh, area to move about. Uh, mm-hmm. Because then you get those uh, tension lines again. Uh, and mm-hmm. The way you place your your uh, the lines, the seams, uh, like not behind every seam, there needs to be a bone placement. Um, mm-hmm. There's, for example, a lot of Edwardian corsets where the um, the seams are not at all corresponding with the the bone. Oh, mm-hmm. one. <laughs> Fantastic. Show and tell, but, uh, wow. Like there's. Uh, there's not actually that many panels in here. There's mm-hmm. one here, there's a gusset here, uh, then there's um, one part here and a gusset as well. And then mm-hmm. there's the back the back area. Mm-hmm. But uh, the seams go uh, higgledy-piggledy, like here there's a curved one, there's the gusset, but all the boning channels are just straight. Mm-hmm. Um, Two at I a see, time, I see. Just, just straight. Yeah, so, so that's one way of doing it. And then the outer um, seam um, proportions or placements can be anywhere you want because mm-hmm. they, they don't really uh, correspond with the burning channels. And right. But then you can also, in like modern, uh, like more modern corsetry, you see that uh, the, the seams do become the channels as well for mm-hmm. the... Uh, mm-hmm. And then it... Um, I like to like give or take, like uh, uh, make panels that are no more than an inch and a half wide mm-hmm. between bones. I see. It yeah. just creates a smoother overall mm-hmm. look. Uh, but um, yeah, you can you can widen that, or or you can just make like uh, really old fashioned stays, uh, for instance. They would just mm-hmm. bone all over. It's just one thing mm-hmm. of boning. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Do you prefer narrower panels because it allows you to have more panels with less intake on each panel, so that you're yes. c- yeah. right? I see. Okay. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, if you have like the two panels that would usually uh, shape the, the bust area, if mm-hmm. you just do two, then mm-hmm. you can just make a uh, one curved uh, shape. Uh, and you get kind of like a pointy cup, um, and you get creases uh, mm-hmm. underneath the, the, the breast as well, which can be just sort of flattering. By mm-hmm. dividing those two panels up in four, or mm-hmm. even more, you can really uh, create a, a, a round effect. And, mm-hmm. um, and a better so distribution. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, and that's also the same for the hip. Um, the hip yeah. uh, sorry, <laughs> for the hip and the waist. Like the more you take in the waist, um, mm-hmm. and uh, the more you leave like the hip part alone of a corset, uh, um, 
if there's a huge difference between waist and hip, uh, if you only divide that difference in four panels, like all around, then mm -hmm. you, you get, there's too much of a difference and you get a really strange shape um, that mm -hmm. only protrudes on one side. And if you divide that up more, then you can make it more gradual and Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, I have experienced that as well. I mean, not met with not with corsets, but in general, suppression seems to be a lot more friendly when there is more of it, but then less in in quantities of yeah. intake. Um, yeah. A question I have is nowadays in to, in today's era, let's say, apart from people who who do theater or or are specialized in making costumes, or even people who do, uh, you know, dress up for parties and stuff. Who wears corsets? Who are the corset wearing clients these days, would you say? Um, uh, well, I have clients from all walks of life, mm -hmm. uh, from all sorts of occasions they wear them. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, more than we might think sometimes. So okay. um, we tend to think it's a very niche thing, but actually like the the, the foundation of a, a bridal dress can also be a corset. It is sort of like a corset. Most of the I time see. it's more like a bustier. And there's a huge difference between like a proper corset and a, and a bustier, although some, yeah, you know, lines get faded sometimes, of course, between yeah. those two. But uh, like uh, uh, um, when you have like a, a, a well-fitting wedding dress, like usually the top part is also they use some kind of boning or rigoline or something to keep the shape up um, mm -hmm. and uh, to not create those wrinkles in areas mm -hmm. where there might be compression. And a lot of uh, off the rack um, kind of wedding dresses are all about compression. I mean, I've had brides in tears in the, in my shop, that try, you know, just asking me, what can I do to make this not so painful to wear? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, um, yeah, just um, the, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good to know because what you're actually describing there is is beyond the immediate kind of because. Um, at least I don't I don't know much about corsets. And when I think about people wearing corsets, I actually try to imagine who would wear like an actual proper corset. But as you're describing it, it, it seems that, you know, the the concept of, of corset can also be diffused into other types of garments that are as rigid as, let's say, bridal wear or other types of garments that that yeah, have yeah. the same yeah, kind so of structure. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, I've got uh, clients that wear it as evening wear when they go to a gala. Instead of mm -hmm. wearing like uh, a, a sequined uh, dress, um, mm -hmm. they want like a beautifully fitted corset made out of silk with mm -hmm. or without embroidery on it. Um, something that can become a conversation piece as well. Um, mm -hmm. And they wear it with a, a pair of really nice palazzo trousers or, or a beautiful skirt, you know, and it's it can be an every, yeah like a um, yeah just a fashionable option instead of mm -hmm. just having the dress you know uh, yeah mm -hmm. and I've also got uh, people that are really into uh, reenactment uh, and uh, like want something that is historically mm -hmm. accurate uh, yeah. now I can do that but it's not it's not completely where my passion lies. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I, it, it helps me immensely to know all the different uh, techniques from over the ages and mm -hmm. uh, to come up with also new ideas for myself mm -hmm. on how to construct a corset. Uh, mm -hmm. I didn't ask you, where where did you learn how to make corsets? How uh, Where did you learn it? And, and I want to do a follow-up question so you can tell me that as well. What was the process of learning corsets like? Like, what is step one, step two, step three, and how does one develop the ability to make corsets? Um, well, how it started for me was by watching all those movies and thinking, 
I, I want to know what it feels like to wear one. I want to own one. Uh, yeah. And and then it naturally became a thing of I want to also make them because mm. what I can find in a shop just is so limited. Like it, it either caters for the fetish industry, which is just a completely different thing altogether, or mm. it's um, uh, like a fashion top, but it doesn't do anything shape-wise. It just it just it doesn't uh, sit well on the body. So yeah. there was just nothing that corresponded to what I had in mind, what I really wanted. And so I was at fashion school and I decided like, okay, at some point we're going to be learning how to do this. Mm -hmm. Like when, you know, like year one, making a a blouse and we're making a skirt and we're making a waistcoat and a a pair of jeans. And then second year, we're making a dress and a coat and I'm like, and when, when, when are we going to make like any kind of foundational garments? Like, mm-hmm. uh, and they're like, oh, no, we're not doing that. Over here. Like, that's just not being taught at all. I was mm-hmm. like, but, but, okay, where do I start? I mean, this is in the time when there wasn't really internet or, you know, mm-hmm. or YouTube or anything. I didn't know anyone that was into the same thing as I was. I was certainly not wearing it. Uh, maybe, mm-hmm. uh, admired it as well by watching it on TV or something, but never the, the desire to actually be able to make any. So uh, when I bought my first one uh, and decided that's not, that's definitely not how it should fit, I, uh, I unpicked half of it uh, with the idea that I could then trace the pattern pieces and alter uh, them where I thought I needed more room more room mm. about, uh, around the hips, uh, more room around the actual rib cage, and then maybe slightly more compression on the waist, um, but uh, not anywhere else. And mm. uh, so I started doing that, and I made a lot of things that were just, you know, horrendous, uh, been worthy, <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah, you yeah. know, you have to make a lot of monsters before you start making something that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And uh, but it's just perseverance and making it and mm-hmm. not letting anything stop you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, well, just um, I I try to go to as many museums as I could uh, and just observing, like what you would do if you're into painting and you mm-hmm. get up close to uh, mm-hmm. to a painting, and you see all the layers. All of a sudden, you start seeing layers. It's not mm-hmm. a huge picture anymore you Mm -hmm. start to see what they've been doing what they're trying to do like how Mm -hmm. can you make something like a little blob look like a pearl from Mm -hmm. you know two meters but like what happens after this and that's what i did with corsets as well i try to get as close to the things as i could um and and just observe like what layers can i spot uh what Mm -hmm. stitching is used um mm. and there's a, there's a lot of dodgy stitching around i always mm. thought that everything that was sewn by others is immaculate <laughs> beautiful <laughs> why is that <laughs> I, would go to, I would go to these fashion um exhibitions uh yeah. like when I, I lived in london for a little while and i'd go to the victorian albert museum and i'd be horrified mm. to see things up close made by these big houses big names like oh my god there's yeah. a safety pin. There's not mm-hmm. even a zip. Like, yeah. You know, but yeah. looking at the corsets and especially the ones that are kind of degrading or, you know, like disintegrating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Disintegrating. Right. <laughs> disintegrating. Uh, when, when they're kind of rotting away, you can see the layers. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. ah, so those channels, you can make them part of the seam mm-hmm. with your seam allowance or mm-hmm. they can just be separate channels all together. And mm-hmm. like, are they made out of twill, uh, like little strips of twill, or are they made out of the same material as the rest of the course it is made out of? Mm-hmm. What are, you know, are, are they all uh, steel boned or do they use other things? Like we hear about these whale bones, like were mm-hmm. they actual whale bones that they work? But like mm-hmm. what, why would you use that instead of the steel? And what difference does it make? And just experimenting and mm-hmm. making 
as many as I as I could. And mm. then uh, when I moved to London after I finished uh, uh, school here, I, I I quickly escaped uh, to London because that seemed to me the place where I could mm. learn different things to that to what was on offer over here. Um, mm. So I would go to museums all the time just to have a, just to look and observe and uh, and try out and. There were other corset wearers in London as well. There's a lot mm -hmm. of people that wear them. And so, yeah, just being inspired also by others. And uh, yeah. Mm. I, I get the sense, I, I get the sense that you are a very, um, you are kind of, you, you have a good ability to analyze things technically and to decompose them. I mean, that's the way you talk about the, looking at other people's work and kind of like extracting layers and kind of like putting them in your own work and being able to, to find a way to incorporate that. How much of that analytical skill that you developed over time was because of your curiosity and how, like, you were so curious that it just automatically developed. That's what I mean. And how much of it did it come from actually you uh, consciously decomposing things, like in notebooks and, and sketching your way through the process of reverse engineering? How was that process for you? Uh, I think what I do a lot is I overthink things mm -hmm. a lot. So, um, so when I go and look at one item, it, it can be that I'm thinking about that for weeks on end, even um, like stopping for a little while, but then two months later, I think, oh, that's how they mm -hmm. did it. Mm -hmm. Just trying out all the different ways, like mostly in my head as well, because I, do, I, I used to do a lot of sketching, a lot of writing about it. And then for some reason, I kind of, it became less. I did that less, and I started um, just making more uh, with mm -hmm. the time that I had. So mm -hmm. trying to just produce, and then um, just by playing around with things, also uh, discovering different ways of going about, it. and then combining that with what I've seen uh, in other people's work, and then. Mm -hmm. Just, just thinking about it the whole time, like mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So sometimes, say, uh, especially if I'm no, if please. I'm working on a report, a commission, uh, mm -hmm. or something, then uh, I tend to even dream about it, you know. And then you you feel mm -hmm. like you've made it six times already. So then when you, when it comes to actually making it, it mm -hmm. becomes so much easier. Yeah, right. You obsess literally about the work. That's how you could explain it. <laughs> One could say so, yes. <laughs> so, so I'm curious to know, when you say you used to sketch and write about it, what did you write? Uh, it, I wanted to, um, uh, to make my notes so that if I didn't look at them for a few years and I would mm -hmm. rediscover them, that I would know what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So not just using key phrases, but really more detailed work mm -hmm. so that I didn't have to reinvent the wheel. Although just by writing it down, it becomes more uh, uh, a physical thing. And then it's like mm -hmm. writing a little note um, at school, you know, before your exam. And you want to yeah. just <laughs> your, <laughs> in your pen case, just, just in case. And just yeah. by writing it out a few times, you never need it again in your life. Like you will remember mm -hmm. it for the rest of your life. All the other stuff you'll forget, but mm -hmm. that remains. So, um, yeah, just, uh, and also because um, I just, I'm, I'm intrigued by, uh, like not just other artists, but also uh, philosophers, uh, uh, writers, and just how they uh, document everything. So, um uh, looking at books, uh, like notebooks by mm. Da Vinci, or like people like that. Just, you know, it's just, I, I like the combination of the 
uh, illustration that you make with the writing, with a nice, uh, neat uh, handwriting and, uh, um, you know, even down to what kind of ink you use or what kind of mm -hmm. pen you use to write it down. Like, yeah, I yeah, just, yeah. It, it became a little bit of an obsession for me to like, make it really nice, everything mm -hmm. really nice all the time. So, but that also constricts you a little bit um, mm -hmm. uh, because then it just, yeah, if it, if it then, uh, yeah, kind of stopped me a little bit to uh, um, be more free about it. Mm -hmm. you know, it has mm -hmm. to all be kind of a certain way or it didn't make sense. <laughs> mm -hmm. Have you noticed that as you were writing about the things you were exploring or or trying to figure out that as you were writing, you also came up with new ideas. Did you experience mm -hmm. that yeah. as well? Or was it more like, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm just noting down what I already know. How was that? No, no, no. It, it's, it is usually in, in writing it down, in really having to, to find words to describe what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. It kind of um, makes you think, about other ways as well. That was also one of the things that I really hated then because then I'd have to cross out certain things yeah. <laughs> and then take a mess of my notebook or remove a whole page or a whole section of it mm -hmm. and it just became a little bit thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So how, when and how did you get into embroidery? Because, and, and this is my ignorant, yeah. and this is this is my ignorant mind. I, I don't know. Are corset making an embroidery throughout history closely related or is this something that you have kind of like combined your passions together i think i combined two passions together i i think because corsets were originally an undergarment they didn't need to be really um mm -hmm. decorative often because uh, no one would see them right. um so you could decorate them with a bit of lace and also because of all the other layers that you wear on top it becomes damaged quickly. Mm -hmm. So anything that you would put on there in um, in embroidery would just kind of wear away. And because what I do, uh, the corsets that I tend to make are not usually for underwear. Uh, mm -hmm. They're usually for um, outerwear, um, mm -hmm. to wear for events or uh, weddings or things like that. They, they are allowed to be seen. And... Um, I tried my hand at embroidery when I was really young and mm -hmm. my mom does a lot of um, uh, cross stitch and uh, she thought it would be really fun for me to also do this but yeah. I would get like um, a ready-made little package with a design already printed on the fabric uh, with the colors that were for that picture and that picture only and, uh, and you had to do cross stitch, and which meant to me that you can see a lot of the fabric in mm. between all the stitches, and I want to fill it up, and right. I want to paint with it. Mm. I want to yeah, get used as if it, if it were paint. So I don't want to see the fabric in between my stitches, and this, um, this little package, however darling it was, it was to me completely boring and mm. a waste of my time. Because mm. someone had already thought of it, already made, already made the design for it. There was no, nothing of me that I could add to it. Mm -hmm. And that really felt limiting. And it felt like a chore, like I didn't want to do it. And even to this day, my, my mother can cross-stitch meters of fabric, most beautiful patterns. But mm -hmm. it, uh, it's not something that I, that I find enjoyable. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... I, I just wanted to um, uh, yeah, decorate the corsets with embroidery, uh, but very uh, particular things that I would think of or that I was inspired by. And I just mm -hmm. couldn't find anything. And then I had a friend who bought herself a embroidery machine. And um, she found this website where they had all sorts of designs, like you can think of it. And it was there. Like, it was just such a huge library of designs. There was always something that you could use to make. But because it was her machine, I couldn't use it. And I would ask her, like, oh, can you can you embroider this, uh, this design for me? Then I can use it on one of my courses. And she would go and change the colors on me. 
Like, yeah, I just improved. I improved. And I'm like, no, but I wanted it like that. And yeah. um, not being in control of the of the situation. Also, also feeling kind of um, uh, like I wasn't partaking in the embroidery itself. Like you mm-hmm. put the design into the machine, mm-hmm. you press play, you sometimes have to change the color of the thread. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you need to re-thread the needle uh, because it come undone. But other than that, mm-hmm. it does its own thing. You know, yeah. it is, I didn't really do anything. I can't take credit for it. And mm-hmm. uh, the only thing you can do is make coffee, you know. I, <laughs> but I can leave the machine alone to stitch and I can mm-hmm. go and make the coffee. So it didn't feel like I was really doing anything that was, yeah, that I would say I made. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, but it didn't stop me from buying my own embroidery machine. And mm-hmm. so I bought one eventually. And I just, oh, the hassle with that thing. Oh my God. I honestly, I, I nearly threw it into the canal. It was just, <laughs> it's like halfway through your embroidery, it would just move like yeah. a millimeter out of line and your whole garment is ruined. So I just thought, okay, I'm just not, I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm just going to do it by hand because mm-hmm. as with like regular sewing that, that, uh, that I do, like everything that you do by hand, you mm-hmm. have control over. Maybe mm-hmm. that's the thing that I really like as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you can decide where the stitch goes. You can mm-hmm. feel the fabric, all of the fabric and all mm-hmm. of the material in your fingers and you can feel what every layer is doing. So mm-hmm. if I put it underneath the machine, I have to think about a lot of other things, like yeah. how how much drag is there from yeah. the transport and how much uh, of the foot uh, is uh, pressing down on my fabric. Do I have to pull one layer more than the other to mm-hmm. get a proper stitch? Like there's so many things, like mm-hmm. something could have slipped and you don't notice until it's it's stitched together, you know? Yeah, so the, yeah. the thing by hand, I really, really liked. And then I had the opportunity to do some embroidery uh, because like usually I also kind of wait for someone to ask me to make something. So someone will give me a commission. They say, I want to corset. It needs to be that color. It's for this occasion. Uh, can you design some uh, uh, some different options for me? And then, uh, and that's what I do. But I thought I want to do even more. And what is, um, do I need to wait for someone to order one? Or can mm-hmm. I just go, go ahead and make it? And, and suggest uh, it, yeah. I, yeah. Chose the matter. I just decided that this is it. I'm going to mm-hmm. now just uh, experiment with embroidery. So there was this, uh, uh, um, this uh, uh, woman from a few centuries ago, uh, Maria Tibila Merian, and mm-hmm. she um, uh, was a naturalist, uh, a biologist, but also an artist. So she uh, made a, a book of all the flora and fauna in uh, Suriname. Mm. And uh, she was one of the first women scientist that was actually allowed to go on sort of a business trip is that the book behind you to um document all the native species of plant and um animals and Mm -hmm. uh i saw her drawings um uh, when i was really small in this beautiful museum in Ireland called the taylor's uh, museum and uh, I was always so fascinated because it wasn't just pictures of beautiful flowers and butterflies. No, it was about every stage of this butterfly. So egg mm-hmm. to larva to mm-hmm. caterpillar uh, to uh, cocoon, chrysalis and actual butterfly. And mm-hmm. it would show uh, the, the plant that these species would would live on mm-hmm. as well, but with like uh, little bites taken out of the leaves or, mm-hmm. you know, like imperfections, impurities maybe, um, just 
interesting, more interesting than just a beautiful bouquet of flowers, you know, uh, mm -hmm. without any any decay there at mm -hmm. all. And it just mm -hmm. fascinated me. I thought, um, uh, I want to know more about this lady and my brother, uh, who is a philosopher, uh, brought me in touch with this other lady who writes about her. And uh, she mentioned that this, this, um, this woman uh, used to teach uh, like uh, rich ladies how to draw in their mm -hmm. gardens. So she would be allowed to go to these beautiful gardens and then teach all these rich ladies how to draw. And uh, while she was doing that, she also uh, created an embroidery with like embroidery designs uh, of um, plants and flowers and butterflies and insects. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I've never been able to find that book. I don't think it exists anywhere anymore. It's just it's mentioned that it existed, and but that's how I started to think about her imagery, her her art. You know, um, like what would it look like mm -hmm. if you were to stitch this out? Like what mm -hmm. what kind of um, uh, stitches would I need to use to make the chrysalis look like a chrysalis? And can I make something that looks a little bit 3D? Uh, mm -hmm. So there's one uh, of these images that I uh, embroidered, and it's got a pomegranate. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know, like, how can you make like the membrane look like mm -hmm. a membrane and the little arrows, you know, the little tips in the pomegranate? Mm -hmm. Like, what can I use yeah. that look like that? So mm -hmm. I just, yeah, wanted to reimagine her work. Um, as embroideries, and that's I just I just started, and I didn't let anything stop me <laughs> to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long have you been embroidering now? Um, I think four years now. So four not years. not not very long, to be honest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, your work does look absolutely pro. So. If you had said, <laughs> yeah, it's really, 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 it's it's unbelievable. So what I'm curious about is what you do is extremely creative. And it's also creative in a very niche way. It's not creative yeah. like you're not you're not designing um, applications, which is creative, but also very applicable, literally. Um, yeah. how does how how difficult was it or maybe still is it for you to be hyper creative and at the same time do whatever you want to do in the creative domain and still make a living out of it like how difficult is it to be someone like you in the Netherlands if other people are watching this and they're like hey this is exactly the route I want to take. Um, yeah. How 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 difficult would that be? Uh, I'd say it is difficult, not impossible, mm -hmm. uh, but it really depends. Like if you if you do this because it's your passion and there's just this inner urge that you need to create, you need to make this item, mm -hmm. um, then. There's really nothing money-wise that could make you do it or make you stop doing it. Like it just—it's mm -hmm. just this thing that you need to do. Um, and when it comes to having to eat every day and have a roof over your head, like you have to just accept that it is not for everybody. Not mm -hmm. everyone can afford something like that. And also, mm -hmm. you don't want to be trapped in a sense that um, someone has to tell you what to make. Like mm -hmm. you want kind of freedom as well. So my favorite clients, and they do exist, and there is clients that will um, specifically save up money to, to have a course made by me. And they're by no means rich or anything, uh, but they, they see the value of mm -hmm. what I do, they see the craftsmanship, and uh, they know that they can't have a whole wardrobe filled with them, uh, mm -hmm. and neither would they want to. 
but they mm. want that special item mm -hmm. that is made for them, only them. Uh, I can do like funny little embroideries on the inside of the corset as well, just a little inside joke, you know, mm -hmm. just no one will see that. And, but it's all for them and, and they're willing to pay for it. And even if they just pay in installments or, uh, uh, you know, it does happen that sometimes I will do a little bit more than is asked uh, for or paid mm -hmm. for, but just because I think, oh, it just needs this this mm -hmm. extra thing, you know, I can't just leave it like this. It The, the work itself needs this extra thing. So, yeah, yeah. This, um, it is not impossible. And uh, sometimes what you also have to remember is that look, not everyone wants a whole corset. I mean, what are you mm -hmm. going to do with it? Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've got one lady, she just has one on display in her living room mm -hmm. and it makes people talk about it, you know, she says it's right. a conversation for her and uh, uh, it's just an item of art now, she doesn't mm -hmm. wear it, it's just there for art's sake, I suppose, yeah. and um, um, it's the same as with uh, bridal dresses, you, you wear that once and unless you're planning on getting married five times, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's a thing that you buy once and then that's it. So, and not everyone wants uh, that, but they may want something made by you just because mm. they like your style or they um, uh, they just want to own a, a part of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. that's where I just do the, the smaller embroidery as well. So I make uh, brooches uh, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, like little clips that you can put in your hair when you're yes. getting married for instance you know just decorations or they want to wear it uh, or to have it just hanging on the wall uh, as mm. well you know just as a piece of art uh, 3d embroidery or uh, i make them in um, like a dome setting as well like a bell jar yeah so uh, i think a lot of people like for instance i myself also like this uh i like those old fashioned displays of the bell jars with like beautiful butterflies on a piece of driftwood, whatever, mounted, uh, you know, with the just, uh, yeah, stunning colors combined together. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't really like the idea of having a dead butterfly on display. I, there's something kind of, you know, like yeah. that. I just, just don't, I just, and also because. If everyone, if everyone wants that, then, you know, how many butterflies that takes or, you know, mm -hmm. I just, I just think that's a little bit wrong. So, uh, but I think if I make the butterfly, then mm -hmm. uh, none of them had to die for it, you know, and uh, I can still have that beauty, but without mm -hmm. all, the, all the other things. Yeah. Well, here's the funny thing, since you like philosophy as well. Uh, you could argue that the butterfly that you make, although it may not fly, it is actually alive because it was created from scratch by you. And uh, yes. for that specific purpose, instead of an already living one having to be killed and then kind of like put on display. Yeah. Uh, are, are, yeah. are, 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 are those things the... Do, I see two of those things uh, uh, behind you in those bills. Are those the examples you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want me to grab them? <laughs> yeah, please, please. I mean, yeah, I, I, I would love to see it. It's, it's insane. So here's, here's. Oh one. my god! <laughs> wow! <laughs> wow! So it's, it's you true with, uh, with pearl, pearl. Uh, that is used in like gold work embroidery mm -hmm. uh, just to make it obvious that it is not a real one just yeah. to kind of because otherwise people <laughs> from a distance will think oh yeah. she's just got <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah yeah butterflies I, oh my God. wow it on a bit. Yeah. you know yeah. what I find and then actually... I, I usually gold plate them as well so, wow. so the did you make the did you make the tree as well or the or the wooden uh Oh, well, yeah, it's a, it's a part of what they use in aquariums to, like, as decoration. Uh -huh, I see, so I like see. A, it's like a bit of driftwood. So I just saw it in half and then okay. I mounted on it. Wow. Just, 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 you know, what I find <laughs> striking is that, you know, usually 
works like the works you're displaying when you display them through like a, a, a camera you know a phone camera they tend to lose a little bit of their glow but that thing oh, you've yeah. made there yeah. does not lose its glow it's just like bah it's just there <laughs> I, I find it incredible honestly i i um, I haven't been to the Netherlands uh, for like I, I think two years now since COVID, but I definitely know who to visit the fir- the next time I'm, I'm in Holland. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I have to. So, so I wanted to ask you a few things, a few other things, um, a bit, a, perhaps a bit more technical, but um, see what kind of answers you 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 are coming up with. So, yeah, what do you think? makes a corset maker a good corset maker from a technical or art artistic point of view how would you judge uh, another corset maker hmm. i think that um being able to make um uh, something that looks well fitting mm-hmm. um and uh, just overall neatly sewn. I think that's mm-hmm. also something that I really value as well. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think the fitting part mm-hmm. for me really tells me if the person knows what they're doing uh, mm-hmm. or if they're doing it for uh, shits and giggles. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And how... Uh... How would you rate the difficulty between making a corset and, for example, making a jacket or a shirt in terms of the pattern? Well, I think um, I th- I, yeah, I think if I if I just if I go down to the, like my basic knowledge of like Runschau, for instance, mm-hmm. which is all about uh, proportions and mm-hmm. not really looking at the individual body but more like what is the look you want to achieve mm-hmm. like you know um, then with corsetry there is very little room for error mm-hmm. um it needs to fit really well of course there is you know uh, you can you can achieve a lot of things through a bit of stuffing you know like mm-hmm. they always say yeah uh, um what the good lord has forgot forgotten we can stuff with cotton you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i think there there's like a similarity uh between tailoring uh and corsetry um mm. where you can definitely use a little bit of pad- uh, padding here and there to mm. achieve a certain silhouette or mm. more drama in the silhouette um but uh, a well fitting cup for instance, mm-hmm. uh, of a bra, mm-hmm. and like a, a cupped corset, that is technically, you know, that that is that is very sensitive. Like you mm-hmm. can very easily make a really ugly boob, and <laughs> you know, it's it takes a bit of skill and knowledge to mm-hmm. uh, to to get a, a pretty a pretty result. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And would you say that? It's easy to identify a badly made corset when you're not as specialized as you are at this point. Uh, well, because you know when you look at a jacket, for example, or a shirt that is badly made or or, or fitted, mm-hmm. you you can instantly yeah. tell the whole thing is just like you know off. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Is, yeah, is, yeah, is, yeah, is yeah. that is the same yeah. the case with with corsets? I think so, yeah. I think that there is not a lot of uh, people that wear uh, like proper bespoke courses. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are a lot of people that just buy them off the rack mm-hmm. and they're all being designed for women with a B cup and kind of a cylinder shape. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you, what you will see is that the back uh, lacing that should just be parallel uh, mm-hmm. is like wonky, that it will be v-shaped oh, or right. or it pulls the boning in at the waist and then it kind of towards towards the top and the bottom uh, it painful. looks like it is a struggle to wear mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm-hmm. uh, yeah it's uh 
Yeah, you can tell it's not made for that person, but uh, like a badly made corset that was actually intended for that person, like someone that has not got a lot of experience or is trying out, like uh, I find it hard to be like overcritical because I always think that if I compare the ones that I made at my very start in this process, then, uh, you know, I wouldn't want someone to be so harsh about it either. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm kind of I'm a bit more reserved about that. But uh, say I've got, because uh, I teach a lot of courses to classes as well. Uh, if I have people uh, coming in, usually they have already tried something out themselves, mm -hmm. whether it was with the existing um, pattern or something that they try to draft themselves, then mm -hmm. I can see, okay, well, this is where you've made the error or even if it's just while we are drafting the pattern, I can see where things don't make sense to me. It's just because I've been drafting courses for, for such a long time, I can tell when it's off, you know, when someone's mm -hmm. made a, a funny snake shape or somewhere where it should yeah. just be nicely streamlined, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, a lot of it comes down to patterning and... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, and, and it's not even so much material that can make or break it because I have now, un, you know, undis uh, discovered over the years that it doesn't really matter what you use. You can most of the time make a corset out of just fabric. You know, it just mm -hmm. uh, one thing will give you a nicer result, but uh, it, the, the make or break is absolutely with the pattern drafting mm -hmm, that, uh, mm -hmm. and how long does it take roughly for the average corset to be made like how, how many days does it take you to make like a basic average corset a basic average corset i do within a day and if i really push myself i could possibly do two right. and um uh, I, I do this quite often. Um, there's a, a fashion house here in the Netherlands that I uh, do corsetry for as well. And mm -hmm. that is a lot of, uh, you know, we need three courses. You've got one week to make them. Make right. it so, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, then I just, uh, um, and that is drafting, making a mock-up, uh, doing a fitting and making the actual thing. And just within one week, three courses. I've done it heaps of time. Mm -hmm. So uh, mm -hmm. you can do it really quickly. And mm -hmm. I, because I've been doing it for such a long time, I can work quick and I can work neatly. Uh, mm -hmm. But if I really want to impress somebody mm -hmm. and who is going to be looking up close uh, at it and it's, it's absolutely made for them and them only, then... Uh, I really do take my time. And any part where I feel like I'm being rushed uh, by myself or mm. uh, other external factors, then I stop, I put mm -hmm. it away, uh, and I make something else. And mm -hmm. this could be that I can make a pile of new uh, little comfy pants for my son, you know, <laughs> just a little production line, mm -hmm. just to get that edge off of wanting to produce something really quickly <laughs> um, to satisfy that feeling that mm. you have really made a pile of stuff um, yeah. no time but I, I really especially with embroidery there is mm -hmm. no rushing I mm -hmm. mean you can't rush that it is just you can rush it in the sense that oh I'll work at, uh, at night on mm -hmm. it and then come the morning I think oh my god how do these colors come together this doesn't work at all. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. do it and that's even more of a, mm -hmm. of a struggle so you know, I just I, I think that is one of the biggest lessons I've had over the years is that I'm allowed to take time to make something mm -hmm. that it's nice that you can do something fast and sufficient and mm -hmm. neat and that's 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 fabulous, but you're allowed to take your time. Mm -hmm. And if someone says, oh, my God, how can you embroider for four months on something? Mm -hmm. Like, you can just put it in a machine and it will do it for you. 
It's mm-hmm. like, no, I'm, I'm allowed to take the time, even if I take three years to make it. It doesn't yes. matter. Yeah. Well, that's how masterpieces evolve. And I, I completely agree with what you say. And I, and I think I've observed this here in my training or during my training on Savile Row. Uh, one of the things I noticed was that um, a lot of tailors, they were rushed into or forced to rush the production of the garments they were creating. And uh, for whatever reason, a lot of them accepted being pushed into rushing things. And that happened so often that it had become a normal thing for any cutter or company to go to a tailor and say, here's a bundle, we need it in three days. And then mm-hmm. and the tailor would just say yes a lot of times. And unfortunately, oh, yeah. it's weird because the things that you are making and, and the things that other people, the similar things that they are making they don't just fall into like an easy category of, like you say, 17 pajamas in one hour. That's a very different category. And for for something to really reach a high level of excellence, um, time is required. And it's a it's a struggle, I think, of ideas, perhaps um, to to see which one should be, you know, should should the tailor accept or should someone like you accept a project that has to take one day or should should they be, be like no the minimum is xyz and and these are the standards that i'd like to uphold yeah. um just, it's, I do, no no please continue uh, i'd like to know your why, thoughts this is why i do uh, a few different things so i mm-hmm. uh, i work for myself i make uh, commissions um uh, for people, uh, then on that on the side of that, I also make whatever the hell I want, uh, mm-hmm. and with no purpose, no nothing. Just um, I want to make something, and I'm diving in, and I'm taking three years to make something. I don't, you know, it's okay. Yeah. And like next to that, I also w- w- take on work for this uh, fashion house, and sometimes also uh, other. Uh, like fashion designers Mm -hmm. um, where it is very much like we want this look uh, um, here's the fabric we wanted tomorrow or yesterday you know if you could and oh we like it so much can you also make it in red and it all needs to be done like Mm -hmm. at the end of the week Mm -hmm. I do that because uh, I like to push my limits sometimes Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really feel sometimes that when I'm at my absolute busiest where I think I can't take on another thing Mm is when I feel most alive, Mm -hmm. like the adrenaline, the stress, the the impossibility, like you get a fabric and you think, how am I going to make this out of that? Mm -hmm. It's not, it's never been done. I don't know if I can do it. Mm -hmm. And here I am doing it. The end result is what they have asked. I have been learning to let go of like traditional ways of thinking of how something has been has to be made. It mm-hmm. has to be made like this. Mm-hmm. That's how I've been taught. You know, there is no other way to get a good result but this exact uh, method. And mm-hmm. then I think, but there has to be another mm-hmm. way because I only have two days, so I don't have time to... Yeah. How it's supposed to, but how can I achieve that mm-hmm. in less? I like to uh, give my brain that kind of exercise, but mm-hmm. I don't like to do that full time, which is why I'm not employed by any of these people full time because I just, I, I think I would work myself to death. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. that just would not be a good thing. And uh, when it comes to someone saying, okay, I want that embroidery, but you have two weeks to make it. Like, I know that if I push myself, I could do something like that, but I won't. Like, Mm -hmm. I won't. That's where I say, okay, this is my area of expertise. Mm -hmm. Um, This needs more time. This Mm -hmm. is just not possible. And there's a reason why it's not possible because it needs to be made with attention to detail. It can't be rushed. Yeah. And then 
on the side of that, I also teach. Uh, so I teach sewing classes and corsetry classes uh, mm -hmm. to people. You to have two two businesses, you said. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I have um, mm -hmm. the corsetry making um, uh, business, and then also uh, like a little sewing school where I just teach mm -hmm. all different people uh, different skills, tailoring, mm -hmm. sewing, corsetry, and everything. In <laughs> yeah. Would you say that if how important has it been for you to have um, your own business, but also have the skills necessary to actually develop your business and make sure that it's steady and stable and, and, and always prospering in the, in the way that you want it to be? Um, uh, I think finding a balance for yourself is always a good thing mm -hmm. so that uh, I think the versatility makes mm -hmm. me less able to get bored with one thing or another because mm -hmm. I can I can switch it and uh, when I need to. Mm -hmm. um, I think it is so important to pass on knowledge and to not just keep it for yourself, but to mm -hmm. uh, share it with others and. Uh, yeah, I, like my biggest struggle when I was living in the Netherlands, I was looking for a teacher, someone mm -hmm. to tell me how to make it. And I had mm -hmm. to become my own teacher for, mm -hmm. for very many years. And at, at a certain point, I also became too shy to ask mm -hmm. um, other people for help or tips or tricks or anything. Why? I was... Um, I think part of it is my character, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, have to, I have to admit. Um, uh, and also, I think part of that character is also that if you haven't struggled yourself, yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to get to where you want to be, you mm -hmm. can't say you've done it. So oh, what I oh. see a lot from me is that, uh, so this may, yeah, this is maybe just a bit, <laughs> a bit <laughs> uh, too much, but um, what I see a lot around me is uh, people uh, uh, hitting the help button mm -hmm. before they even think about a solution. Yes. So um, I see that in my teaching as well. Um, someone will say, how, how do I do this? Here, you do it. You know how to do it. Um, so you uh, insert the zip, for instance. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, well, uh, I know how to do it. I've been practicing for many years, so I know how to do it. But you're here in class to learn how to do it yourself. How to work uh, it out. Yeah. So and then I can I can show them ten different ways on how to do this. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I will ask them is that how do you think it's mm -hmm. being done, mm -hmm. and why would you mm -hmm. do it like that? I try to make them use their own noodle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of quickly <laughs> pressing the help button. And I think because, yeah. um, and it's not being, not like withholding information or anything, but making them just try to think about it mm -hmm. because it makes them understand a lot more about why do things in a certain way. Yeah, It makes you uh, be able to problem solve um, uh, a lot better as well. So, uh, yeah, so I just... I, I learned from many different books. I've seen many different techniques. I've mm -hmm. tried to find a teacher and I couldn't really find anyone mm -hmm. that was willing to share their knowledge without mm -hmm. fear. Fear yeah. of me um, taking all their secrets and, you know, um, yeah, just making money out of that or mm -hmm. uh, taking credit for something they have obviously also fought and struggled to mm -hmm. uh, obtain. So, so yeah, I've been my own teacher for a very long time. And that also means you're reinventing the wheel a lot of the time. Yeah. And I think there are multiple easier ways for me to get where I am. But mm -hmm. if I hadn't done it this way, um, 
I, I wouldn't know as much as I do now. And mm -hmm. I also now know there's just so much more to learn that yeah. I'm also going to explore. Yeah. Well, you, this is, I mean, this is a, another hour conversation on itself, but you are posing a very important question there, actually, which is, you know, what is really the role of a teacher? And, and, and I've been thinking about that a lot. And I've also simultaneously been thinking a lot about who is really a master in what they do. And I, first of all, I don't really have an answer. So I'm, I'm learning as much as I can from these conversations. But one of the things that I have thought about is that a lot of people who did become exceptionally good in what they did didn't have someone who told them how to do it all the time, which which kind no. of like forces them to go into weird places, you know? I mean, look at the stuff you make. That that's that doesn't come out of a template. You know, you know, I you don't just go on Google and and type in how you know how do I make everything Marluce makes and then you get like all the answers. It's like you go through history books, you go through the, and actually as you're going into the history books, you're asking the question, what is the other side of the story? I don't want to hear about the knight and all the heroes. I want to hear about, you know, the, the hidden stories of, of the other people that aren't mentioned in there. And then you go through that and then you go through the journey of the, uh, of, 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 the, of the woman you mentioned, uh, Marianne, uh, and, and yeah. the, her joy, and you fantasize. You're like, how would her work be in the embroidery form and all of that? And, and, then, and then that creates, you know, a part of you. Whereas if I would join your atelier and you would tell me all the things that you have kind of like summarized after a long journey, I'm only going to get the summary and it's going to be your summary. The question is, yeah. what is my summary as a student and how can the teacher support the student here and there, but at the same time, really encourage and push them to go into their own journey and their own story. It's a very tough one. And sometimes you, I wonder, uh, does it help to be the teacher that shares all the information? Um, does that make the students lazy? Or should you be the teacher that sometimes on purpose with the intention of you go and think, withhold certain things or at least delays the revealance of them you know um mm -hmm. it's 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 a very very interesting thought that i would like to explore further um but now what i would like to do is i'd like to do a speed round with you so i i have a few words that i kind of like r wrote down as during our conversation and i'd like to know the first thing that you think of when you hear the word and if you can summarize it in a word, uh, that would probably make it more interesting for me. So, are you ready? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let, let's start with the first one, which is history. Sorry? History. Oh, history. Uh, mesmerizing. <laughs> mesmerizing. Okay. Philosophy. Yeah. Impossible at Impossible. times. <laughs> Impossible at times. Okay. Um, running running your own business. Uh, a marathon, not a sprint. <laughs> a marathon, a marathon. Okay. Um, yeah. Being self-taught or being an apprentice? Mm. Ooh, uh Perseverance. Perseverance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, culture. Mm. Um, inspiration, for sure. In inspiration. Yeah. Analytical skills. Handy to have. Handy. <laughs> <laughs> um, what does it mean to be an artisan? You can you can answer this one with more words if you'd like. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, I once heard someone say this, that um, uh, fashion is often seen as a frivolity, mm -hmm. but in actual fact, it is a discipline. Mm -hmm. And I think being an artisan is really to explore the, uh, the discipline of something. Mm -hmm. uh, create until your fingers know what to do mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, until you can look at a fabric or you can look at a person and their shape and you already know what to do with mm -hmm. a pattern mm -hmm. shape um, even using colors or textures and yeah being mm -hmm. able to do that that means you need a lot of uh, knowledge on, on in, in very different fields, mm -hmm. um, anatomy, but also material choices and mm -hmm. how they behave themselves or misbehave. And how, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay, okay, that's a very good answer. Uh, uh, I will certainly explore that. Um, the ideal student. He's a nosy Parker. <laughs> a nosy Parker that is curious until it becomes annoying. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Because that also, okay. it makes you think. It makes you think. Because mm -hmm. I, I've often come across like teachers, like especially at my fashion school, where you're asking too many questions they don't know the answer to. Mm -hmm. And they're being like, oh no. That's for some. That's for another time, and I'm and I'm thinking, is that really for another time? Like now is the time. I mm -hmm. want to know now, and mm -hmm. why not? Because they actually didn't know themselves, yeah. and I see that with a lot of makers as well. Mm -hmm. They make something because this is how they were taught to make mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. not because that is the only way there is, but just this is what they're comfortable with. And mm -hmm. this is how you do it. And, uh, you know, there might be a million other ways, but that's mm -hmm. not what we're doing. You know, we do it like this. Mm -hmm. And um, that, um, but also not really knowing why you do it this mm -hmm. way and not mm -hmm. another way. It's mm -hmm. just, you've not used your own noodle. That's just, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. you yeah. have to explore. I need to know why do I do this to get this result? Mm -hmm. I really want to know. And that would make a good student that they that they say, okay, now I see you do it like that. Mm -hmm. You're teaching me this technique, but why are we doing it like that? And mm -hmm. why can't I do it in a different way? And I just I let them explore it all. You know, I try mm -hmm. to like say, okay, well, if you think you have a better method, mm -hmm. show me, show yeah. me what it is that you think will work, and then we see if it will or if it doesn't and maybe we have found the newest technique in corsetry mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 um the yeah. ideal teacher um uh, is open um and um doesn't yeah doesn't hide things you know it doesn't just really is there to to spread their knowledge, mm -hmm. not to keep it to themselves, to spread mm -hmm. it, to let it grow without mm -hmm. fear of anyone starting their own business and doing the exact same thing. I think that's what I've come across myself, been annoyed about myself so much yeah. Yeah. and would never want to be like that. But I also think that a teacher, I find that my method it works for me let's say this it works for me um that i am uh, approachable mm -hmm. to my students and i explain things to them with kindness and mm -hmm. patience mm -hmm. so some people i need to tell them a uh, hundred times how to do the same thing mm -hmm. and you know i need even if i at the hundredth time i need mm -hmm. to be able to teach them or tell them how to do it um, with patience and kindness because we all have different ways of learning and absorbing things. And I also like to then try different ways to teach them this thing. Mm -hmm. So with some people, you have to really show them. With other people, you have to hold their hands while they do things. Mm 
-hmm. And with other people, you just have to mention it and they can work it out in their brain already. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's knowing how to adapt your your methods to different types of students. This was mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> um, let's see. I think I've wrote something. I can't read my own handwriting again. Uh, the worst thing about corsets? Uh, the prejudice against them. Prejudice. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that it's 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 a it's a torturous device that is there to suppress women. And you know, my mom said to me, "This is not what our foremothers have fought for. They fought to release us from this thing, and you're putting women back into them yeah, and men, yeah. by the way." Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. It, there's a lot of misinformation about course. It's um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. It's okay. just an item. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, it's it's definitely something of of um, what's the word um, of controversy when when it's kind of like viewed in in the in the wrong framework. Let's say. Um, yeah. Last but not least, uh, Marlus, the creator. <laughs> How would you how would you describe yourself if you had to use one word? Hmm. A dreamer. Yeah. Dreamer. 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 <laughs> yeah. 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 Amazing. Uh, Marlus, thank you. Thank you so much. I I cannot wait to uh, visit your studio and see all the beautiful work that you've created. And I'm sure it's going to inspire me for a very long time once i actually see the work from up close so thank you very much oh, I look forward to meeting you in real life and thank you for having me <laughs> it's my pleasure thank you and that was marlous did you see the butterfly she made unbelievable it just looked like a 3d render augmented into the conversation which parts did you find interesting please share your thoughts in the comment section as i would like to know what you think if you want to see more from Marluz, check out the links to her Instagram and website in the description of this video. And if you've enjoyed our content so far and you'd like to support us, then please subscribe to our channel. Until the next time, bye-bye.